This is the recording of The Great Debate from Education Nation. This was recorded on Tuesday, and the format for The Great Debate was opening remarks from Dr. David Zingier. His voice is the first voice that you will hear after mine, followed by opening remarks from Dr. Kevin Donnelly. After that, uh, Dr. David Zingier and then Dr. Kevin Donnelly again were both given five minutes to give some rebuttal uh, to the other's arguments. And after that, it was then open to questions from the floor um, and some rebuttal there. The aim for the questions from the floor was that they would be um, turnabout, one for Dr. Zingia, followed by one for Dr. Donnelly. Um, and they did typically follow that format. So the first voice that you will now hear is Dr. Zingia's, followed by Dr. Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for Education Nation for... Uh, hosting this great debate. I'm not sure whether today we've actually acknowledged the original custodians of the land, so in that case I'm going to do so right now, and also to acknowledge the working men and women who built this place, maintained this place, so that we can enjoy its comforts today. Uh, in this debate, I want to show how the neglect of public education is a threat to our democracy. Now, I'm going to ask a number of questions. What are the consequences of this neglect for student achievement? Where has all the education money gone? Do private schools actually outperform public schools? Uh, do they save money? <clears throat> and then conclude that public education is a foundation for a vibrant democracy and that choice, if we're going to have choice, needs to be a genuine choice. The neglect of public schooling can be traced back to the introduction of federal funding to private schools. Starting with the Fraser government, funding policies began to neglect the concept of need and foreground the principle of entitlement, of privilege for the few, an anti-democratic notion. The entitlement principle resulted in increasing amounts of public money going to private schools, with a consequent expansion of that sector at the expense of public education. And some of you will recall, hopefully most of us, that recently our former treasurer, Hockey, now ambassador in, in the United States, declared that the age of entitlement is over. And yet public funding of non-government schools is about to reach and then soon exceed public funding of similar schools, similar government schools. Adding the income from fees, the income that many private schools today have to spend on teaching, on resources and facilities, exceeds that of our public schools, sometimes by a considerable amount. Increased funding has enabled private schools to enhance their market appeal through such means as improving facilities and creating smaller classes. And notwithstanding what John Hattie said on education, on Revolution School last week, that small classes don't matter, uh, teachers in here know what I'm talking about. Which in turn attract further as aspirational parents and children. It's led to a steady drift of students from the public system almost entirely comprising those from higher SES backgrounds. The public education system today, as we know, carries over 80% of all students from educationally disadvantaged backgrounds. The massive ongoing disparity in funding between private and public schools is, I would like to say, a national disgrace and a scandal. The learning needs of our disadvantaged students are being ignored by the priority given to funding more privileged sections of the community. Clearly, this entitlement principle endangers our democracy. So what have been the consequences for Australian education? Well, such developments have a number of serious consequences for our kids, including that they widen resource disparities between schools, reduce educational outcomes, particularly for students from educationally disadvantaged backgrounds, and diminish the social and cultural mix of our schools. Schools no longer have the capacity to promote social and intercultural understanding, the very foundation upon which our vibrant democracy stands. Just missed a page here. I've lost a page. Dear me. Dear me. I hope you're Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Time. 
Like all good teachers, we have to win it sometimes. I, prob I probably left it on the aeroplane. <laughs> the priority for government funding in Australia must be to support public education. The purpose of an excellent, appropriately funded public education system is to help ameliorate the inevitable inequalities that result from the lottery of birth. The choice model has contributed to the decline in enrolments in public schools nationally. The importance of choice for parents has been promoted at the expense of equity for students. Choice is only available for those who have the money to pay for that privilege. Certainly not for those on a basic wage of $35,000 or those on a median wage of $50,000 whose taxes go to subsidise the choice for the wealthy. Stephen Dinham of the University of Melbourne and the president of the Australian College of Educators recently wrote that it's, not hard, it's hard not to conclude that we are see, what we are seeing is a deliberate strategy to dismantle public education, partly for ideological and partly for financial reasons. If these developments continue, then the inevitable outcomes will be greater inequity and continuing decline in, ed in educational performance that will provide the proponents of change with further evidence to support their position for even more far-reaching change. The more that our public education system becomes residualised, the greater will be the flight of those who can flee. How many of you have travelled overseas on a long-haul plane? Hand up. How many of you travelled and paid for a business class ticket? How many first class? <laughs> How many of you not travelled on a long haul flight to say to LA or London? Poor you. <laughs> As you enter the plane, I'm sure you'll notice those sitting in business class. They've paid $6,000 for their ticket. I've paid $1,500 for mine in the economy. What about those first class who've had a chauffeured car pick them up from home? Personalised immigration and lounge services, a whole room, a personalised menu, a sommelier, whatever that is, and a butler, all for about $10,000. We all get to this destination at the same time with a different modicum of comfort. But to the people in first and business class, expect those of us in cattle class, or even those who do not fly, to subsidise their choice? Well, that's how our education system in Australia works. More than 40% of Australian secondary children now attend private schools. Australia is one of the most privatised school systems in the OECD. Prior to the late 1960s, private schools received no government funding whatsoever in this country. While most OECD countries have a private school system, very few of them receive actual public funding. Think about England, the home of the elite private school, the Hogwarts, and the exclusive private schools in the USA. Not one cent of public money goes to fund those schools. Since the 1970s, Australia has seen a significant increase in the inequity of funding and a widening achievement gap between rich and poor. International comparisons show that while Australian students are among the best performers in the world, we are one of the lowest ranking in terms of the achievement gap between the lowest and highest performers. In fact, we can actually chart our downgrade in PISA results with the growth of state and federal funding of private schools. A major cause of that gap is that successive governments have neglected public education and in doing so increased the social stratification of Australian schools. This is a real threat to the fabric of our democratic society. I want to argue that both the decline in funding and the trend to privatise education needs to be tackled simultaneously by basing our strategies on agreed understandings of the essence of what it means to have a public education system. Thank you. Thank you. I
I think we did give you a couple of extra minutes there because of the note issue. So Sorry, I found we'll, the page. We'll, that's all right. <laughs> we'll give Kevin the same opportunity yes, if he wishes to. Oh, just one comment I'm going to make, though. I, I strongly suspect that if we actually ask the people who ran the airline, they'd probably tell you that the people in first class and business class are actually subsidising the cost of the cheap economy class there, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please welcome Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, great that you're all still here late in the sort of afternoon, and I'll try and be quick because I have to rush back to the airport to fly back to Melbourne. But uh, no, no. Uh, actually, I, I took my wife's points and upgraded to business. So that happens. Uh, I'd like to say first of all that I'm often painted as a conservative reactionary. Eurocentric, patriarchal, misogynist, Islamophobic, uh, worst of all, Christian uh, advocate. But in fact, I grew up in a working class area in Melbourne. If you're from Melbourne, you might know Broad Meadows, <coughs> where Annie Maguire grew up. But, uh, and, and the interesting point there is that Dad was in the Communist Party and he worked at the Newport Railway Station, or workshops rather, <coughs> which was a cell for the Communist Party of Australia. And as a young kid, my brother and I were in the Eureka Youth Movement, which, has anybody ever heard of the Eureka Youth Movement? Come, good, a couple of you have. <clears throat> it was the Young Communist Party. Uh, but Mum was a good Catholic, so it was a very interesting household. It was sort of Mass on Sunday and Chairman Mao and Stalin on, on, on Tuesday. But it gave me a real interest, I suppose, in ideas and debate and, and ideology. And... Uh, because I taught in government schools for about 12 years and was involved with the VSTA in Victoria, the Victorian Secondary Teachers Association, I got very much involved in the debates back then about uh, Year 12 and academic curricula versus meritocracy versus all, you know, shall be winners. So I've always enjoyed the debate, but I don't want to be too antagonistic today. I don't want to be too vitriolic because my daughter tells me it's bad for my karma. She just came back from India and she's terribly much into wellness and meditation and stillness with her grade one primary school kids. I still call it grade one because I'm old fashioned. But firstly, Australia has a tri tripartite system. So Catholic, independent and government schools, there's been a general consensus among the major parties, the ALP, the Coalition, not the Greens, but certainly the major parties, since the time of, Men of Menzies, as David said, there's been a, a, a consensus in support of that tripartite system. And Julia Gillard, when she was Education Minister, gave a speech just before Gonski was set up. And I'll quote from her. She was committed to, her government was committed to, the full right of parents to choose the schools that best meet the needs of their child. So Julia Gillard was very much in favour of school choice. She went on to argue, quote, I believe it's time we got beyond the public versus private divide that has blighted our education debate for so long. And I tend to agree with that, even though when I write for the papers, I do uh, often argue the case in a more provocative style. But if you look at uh, the Gonski model, and I'd argue, I'll say later, there is no Gonski, it's an urban myth. But if you look at the original Gonski model and the Howard government's SES model, they are in fact all needs based. So I'd have to disagree with, with David that in fact that there's been a con conscious effort to undermine government schools the system pretty well for the last 20, 30 years has been needs-based. I argue very strongly parents have a right to choose. The Convention Against Discrimination in Education, the International Agreement, states, quote, it is essential to respect the liberty of parents to ensure that religious and moral education of children are in conformity with their own convictions. And there's no doubt that parents around Australia embrace school choice over a 10-year period 1998 to 2008, non-government school enrolments went up by about 20%, government school enrolments by about 1.2. So parents are voting with their feet. I know that enrolment trend has slowed down. And I'd argue it's not just about 
the fact that non-government schools were being financed because, in fact, a lot of that growth was in low-fee-paying non-denominational schools, certainly in our major cities. I'd like to just look at uh, four myths or, or, or distortions, if you like, about this debate. Number one, critics argue that Catholic and independent schools are overfunded. The reality when you look at government funding, state, territory and federal, on average, based on 2012-13 figures, government schools get 15700 per student in recurrent funding, Catholic schools 9300 independent schools 7500 and Jennifer Buckingham from the CIS earlier this year put out a report where she argued, in fact, that the majority of schools, Catholic, independent and government, are in the six to 9,000, 9,000 to 12,000 funding bracket. That's government funding. So it's all very well to talk about the King's School or Melbourne Grammar, but in fact, most of the independent and Catholic schools, certainly the systemic Catholic schools, aren't in that top league. And we have to understand, too, that Catholic and independent schools are responsible generally for their own infrastructure and uh, capital funding. Government schools, 91.4% are primarily funded by states and territories. And you have to understand when people condemn the, <coughs> condemn the, condemn the Commonwealth government, it's mainly the states and territories that are putting the money up. And so I'd argue the AEU... Uh, should be arguing not against uh, the Turnbull government if they want to get Gonski up. They should be arguing against those states and territories that have never committed to Gonski, like Victoria. Add the fact that Julia Gillard, when she was Prime Minister, went around before the last election trying to get states, territories, sectors to agree to Gonski, gave them all separate agreements so that we now have 27 different versions of Gonski. I'd argue it was never fully implemented. I'll just quickly get through this because I'm running out of time. Non-government schools, another myth is that they only, they only serve wealthy communities and achieve strong academic results because of high SES. So the argument is they only get the bright kids, the smart kids, and they come from privileged families. All the research uh, here and overseas shows that SES, or socioeconomic status, is only about 10 to 18% of the influence on outcomes. A greater influence is student ability and motivation, teacher quality, effective curriculum, parental uh, engagement in terms of expectations. But SES, and this is the myth that Gonski is built on, really is only 10 to 18 per cent. And there are far more important factors. The reality is we've been spending billions of additional dollars on education over the last 10, 20 years, and standards have not really improved that much. Non-government schools don't residualise government schools. In fact, if you look at uh, around Sydney, for example, I think there are over 30 to 40 selective schools, part or full, in terms of how they select their students. I would suggest that government schools, selective schools, are also a culprit here, not that we ever hear about them. And also, Jeff Masters, only recently in a paper he put out, quoted the OECD as saying that Australia is high quality, high equity, and a second paper from the University of Adelaide this year put Australia second to Denmark out of 20 countries in terms of intergenerational mobility. So I'd argue we have a very uh, strong system in terms of equity and mobility. And a 2008 OECD study also concluded that when it says, quote, Australia is one of the most socially mobile countries in the OECD and it talks about our health and education system as being a reason for that. Choice and diversity in education is what I value, parents value, and I, I disagree that it's counterproductive. Catholic and independent schools and school choice lead to stronger educational outcomes. Generally speaking, non-government schools compared to government schools achieve stronger literacy, numeracy and Year 12 results even after adjusting for students' SES. So there are other factors there we need to really identify. Also, schools, when you look at them, the non-government schools, they have better completion rates, better entry to tertiary, and their kids don't just all drop out when they go into university. They have the same attrition rate as government school kids. And uh, in particular, I'd like to finish by saying that
as Julia Gillard did all those years ago, we meet, need to move on from the debate where it's acrimonious and uh, there are winners and losers. And we have to say, I'd suggest, what is it about schools around the world, but also Australia, obviously, that we can characterise as stronger performing or more effective schools? Now, whether it's academic, whether it's uh, more uh, aesthetic or emotional, spiritual values. And we need to say, well, what is it that we can learn and how do we apply that to all of our schools? Now, I argue, and it's a whole other debate, you're not going to get it with a centralised, bureaucratic, command and control approach where all roads lead to Canberra. I'd argue in favour of school autonomy, school choice, and we need the flexibility and diversity to give schools the ability to innovate. Thank you. So we now have an opportunity for a rebuttal, so we'll invite David to do a brief rebuttal, and then we'll go back to Kevin and then we'll have some questions. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'd just like to rebut one thing and get this correct. International research does not support your claim, Kevin, that SES has between 10 and 18 per cent impact on a student achievement. In fact, and I'm sure that you think that John Hattie's work is, is pretty good, John Hattie himself in Visible Learning says that family background comprises of 50 per cent of student outcomes. The only person that I've seen Kevin Donnelly quote as a researcher for that figure of 10 to 18 percent is Gary Marks from ACER. I've not read any other international research that's been peer-reviewed to suggest such a figure. So where is our public education money going? Because Kevin's been talking about money. Increased funding to private schools has occurred in a policy environment which promotes choice in an education market. In this environment, public education has come to be seen by policymakers as a safety net, a provision for those who cannot afford private education, rather than as a public good. Across Australia, the dollar increases for private schools has been nearly five times the amount of that for public schools. Kevin suggested that private schools outperform public schools. Is there a return on that massive investment that he talked about? The cost of sending a child to a private school in Melbourne can be up to $505,000 over 13 years after tax, in addition to the massive public subsidy that these schools already receive. Analysis of NAPLAN results in like public schools show that they're just as good as those in private schools. The often presumed better results of private schools are a myth. Public schools are the equal of private schools. Public, Catholic and independent schools, that tripartite system that Kevin mentioned, with similar socioeconomic com composition, have very similar results. Research into Year 12 results in New South Wales and Victoria actually confirms that finding. In the top 20 private schools in Victoria, the average cost to educate a student was $23,400 last year. In the top 20 public schools, secondary schools in Victoria, that spend was $10,400, nothing like $15,000. The extra $13,000 that per student actually achieved a slightly lower gain in improvement academic results in these elite private schools. In other words, our public schools are delivering a greater bang for each buck per student. If you're just looking at academic results, and that's not what it's all about, it probably isn't worth paying all that money for an elite private school. Kevin hasn't mentioned, but he often does, that private schools save public money. And we all pay taxes, so we're entitled. It's often suggested, and Kevin's written this in the past, that every child who goes to a private school saves the public $5,500. In fact, the state and federal governments would have saved $2 billion annually over the past four decades had they educated all private students, private school students in a public school system. The reality is, and I'm quoting from the Productivity Commission, is that increased public recurrent investment in non-government schools between 1973 and 2012 
has increased the overall costs to government rather than produced overall savings. Each private school pupil now receives on average a non-means tested public subsidy of over $9,000 at the expense of the less privileged public school students. And how much do we, do we think that the Catholic Church contributes to the recurrent funds of their children in their systemic schools? 75% of those funds come from your pocket and mine, from the public purse. 22% comes from parent fees and 3%, 3%, based on my school analysis, comes from the Catholic education system to fund their own children. Private schools are about to operate at a far more substantial and previously unimaginable public cost. But private school lobbyists claim that those who choose private schools already pay taxes, as Kevin's um, mentioned, and so are entitled to receive at least a contribution from their taxes to pay for their education choice. This is akin to the Automobile Chamber of Commerce suggesting that the use of private cars not only saves public money on public transport, but actually wanting their members to receive a subsidy on the purchase of their new Merc or BMW. Similarly, no one believes that those choosing to use private tolls should receive a subsidy for the use of that toll instead of using the freely public available road that their taxes have already paid for. Given that we have an ever-increasing shrinking tax base, we need to have a discussion, a serious discussion, about gradually reducing public funding to private schools by 25% every four years until we reach zero. This should give these schools time to get their budgets in order. And remember, prior to 1972, they were all doing quite well, thank you, without public support. A strong and viable government school system is vital for the nation's future. Australian society and its distinctive values depend on the practical expression of tolerance, fairness, egalitarianism and equality of opportunity that public schools and only public schools provide. The willful undermining of universal public education, John Ralston Saul, the Canadian philosopher, writes, by our governments and the direct or indirect encouragement of private education is the most flagrant betrayal of the basic principles of representative democracy. And he concludes, any weakening of universal public education can only be a weakening of the long-standing essential role that universal public education plays in making us a civilised democracy. Thanks. Here we go again. Gary Marx, I do often quote uh, in terms of the argument that SES only amounts to 10 to 18 per cent of the influence in terms of educational outcomes. And he, he is an expert in the area. I, I take his uh, work very seriously, as a lot of people do. So he's published peer reviewed journals around the world, uh, worked at the ACER for many years, and then at Melbourne University. It's not just Gary Marx, by the way. The OECD's PISA report that came out just earlier this year, titled Low Performing Students, mentions a figure of 15%. So if the OECD's also got it wrong, I think we're in a bit of trouble. Uh, the ACER, Australian Council of Educational Research, in Camberwell in Melbourne, their report, Australian report on PISA, uh, a year or two ago, also put the figure at around about 15 to 18%. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in, yes, it's true, no, it's not. But all I want to say, again, is that if you do your own research, go on Wiki, maybe, or Google it, you'll see that there's a general consensus that there are more important factors determining educational outcomes. As I said, student ability and motivation, and nobody often wants to talk about uh, innate ability because that is uh, politically incorrect, but a lot of the studies of twins around the world shows that innate ability, what you're born with, is actually very, very important. But it's also motivation, uh, grit was mentioned before. Schools setting high expectations and high standards is also very important, as is having a rigorous curriculum. Some of you might know I co-chaired the review of the national curriculum two years ago. And the reality is, 
we dumbed down the curriculum in Australia during the 90s and 2000s. And when you look at strongly performing education systems, especially in maths and science, they have far more academically based rigorous curriculum. And I think that's part of the problem. But the research is clear that SES is not the main factor. I'd also like to say very uh, quickly that we've had a needs-based system and if Jeff Masters quotes OECD research saying that we're high quality, high equity, then again I'll take his word for that. There is a lot of uh, social mobility in Australia, as I said, and the education system has been prominent in allowing that. And the fact is, uh, I'd suggest public education is not being residualised I was a member of the union, the teachers' union, for many years, the VSTA in Melbourne. And one of the things I hated was that because I was in a migrant working class school out at Maryland in top, near Thomastown, some of the teachers said, our kids are wogs, they're not going to do that well, so we've got to do Puberty Blues, some of you might know, or BMX magazines. We can't do Shakespeare or, or Greek tragedy. We can't do hard math because they're migrant kids. Now, I really hated that dumbing down, that setting low expectations. I'm a great believer in setting the bar high and having those expectations. And kids will generally do well if they're given the opportunity. The fact is, too, that when you look at the Commonwealth and state funding, in terms of recurrent funding, government schools are currently getting 94% of that. So if you look at, in fact, the figure includes total funding, 94% government schools get state, commonwealth, 6% comes from parents, Catholic schools get 72% of government funding, the rest is made up from local funds, independent schools only get 42% on average from governments. And what you have to understand is that parents for independent schools are putting in the other 58%. Now, I'm a great believer in school choice, as I said. International covenants and agreements support school choice. Unlike David, I don't believe in uh, this kind of Eastern European socialist idea that we all have to become corralled into the state system. I do believe, in fact, in, that a good system is one where you have flexibility and choice. And if you look at those uh, systems overseas, there has been a bit of a tipping point the last five, ten years. Now, whether it's England, America, South America, especially Chile, a lot of these education systems are looking towards charter schools in America, <coughs> free schools or academies in England. New Zealand only last year legislated for what they call community or free schools. The cutting edge of innovation in education around the world is in choice and flexibility and autonomy. And that's why the coalition government initiated the Independent Public Schools Initiative, which is another debate. Uh, I'll leave it there and hopefully we'll have lots of questions. Thank you. I think you've got microphones over there, so you might like to answer these questions from where you're sitting. So the two questions that came in before the debate started. So I'll ask the first one to David. So we'll go turn around, turn about. This is the question. Given non-government schools are long established in the Australian education system, how politically feasible is it to argue that public funding of them should cease? Is not Gonski a reasonable compromise with its largely needs-based sector-blind distribution? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and I think I answered part of it in my initial remarks. Uh, Unlike Kevin, I do believe that the uh, Gonski student resource standard model was far different to the Howard so-called um, uh, funding model, which was based on some bogus postcode uh, where students um, came from, but not their family income. So we had this anomalous thing going on in Victoria, for example, where Students at Geelong Grammar, if their if their parents lived uh, in a rural area but owned five hundred thousand acres, they were called disadvantaged because most of the people who were living around 
that area were disadvantaged. And so that school, Geelong Grammar, uh, which is charging $35,000 a year for year 12, receiving millions of dollars in public funding each year. Um, the Gonski model was, um, was, tie was tied from the very beginning when Julie Gillard said that not one dollar will be lost by any school through this review. That was the initial starting point and Gonski acknowledges himself that that was a problem that they had to overcome and that they couldn't overcome. <coughs> In Australia today we have uh, some schools, both public but mainly private, that are over-resourced, that are way over the resource standard. And uh, what we need to do is have a rethink of the Gonski model, tweak it in the edges, and make sure that every school is adequately resourced. One of the things that we need to actually have is a really good public school in every neighbourhood. And if we had a really well-resourced public school in every neighbourhood, we wouldn't need to have private schools springing up uh, in, in the growth corridors of our big cities in, in uh, Melbourne, in Sydney, in Brisbane. And those, those new schools that are springing up, those private schools, those low, so-called, as Kevin said, low-fee, uh, non-denominational schools, are actually 95% funded by the public. That's why they're low fee. We don't have a tripartite system of school system in this country. We have one system. We have one system where 50% of the schools are totally publicly funded. 20% of the schools are over 60% publicly funded. And the rest are under 50% publicly funded. Kevin talked about Chile in a moment ago, and in Chile, the government there has just decided to stop funding private schools out of the public purse. If we had a genuine Gonski model, every school would be well funded based on its needs, and parents would have genuine choice. Uh, currently, they don't. I assume it's on, or is there a switch? No, it's on. Hello, hello. Yeah, just very quickly, as I said, there's a broad consensus among that, that parental choice is a good thing and it should be supported. You only have to remember Mark Latham and his so-called hit list of wealthy private schools and how that went down to understand that it's going to be a very brave politician to stand up and uh, to, to repeat that mistake. The Gonski... Uh, student resource standards, some of the research out of uh, Melbourne shows that the model was flawed because when you look at the methodology, they identified particular schools that were at, at or above the standard required in terms of literacy and numeracy. But I won't go into it uh, in detail, but the suggestion is that it was flawed. Gonski is not sector blind, by the way. Non-government school parents, when you look at how the schooling resource standard is, is worked out, they, uh, the funding they get from government is based on capacity to pay. So if you're a parent who chooses a Catholic or an independent school, at least 10% of the school SRS has to be from local funds. It's based on capacity to pay. Obviously, if you're at the King's or Melbourne Grammar or Xavier, you'll be paying a lot more locally. Non-government school parents have to pay. Government school parents don't. So you can be a wealthy parent in Baldwin, near where I live, where it costs $2 million to get into the enrolment zone and you don't have to pay uh, in terms of Gonski. And I argue that's discriminatory. Just very quickly, there was a report, OECD, and I'm sorry I keep quoting them, but they are the experts. They put out a report earlier this year about underperforming students around the world. And again, I'm not making this up. You can look at the research. I'll give you the uh, citation later. They say, in fact, Australian students, underperforming students, are, quote, the best resourced, have the best resourced schools among the OECD. So I'll have to repeat that because people don't understand it or don't want to believe it. It's not about resourcing. It's not about money. It's not about investment. Our underperforming schools or students are the best resource among the OECD.
So it gets back to teacher quality, uh, motivation, commitment. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about are the attrition rates. A lot of beginning teachers leave after four or five years, and that's a great shame, it's a great waste. There are other issues here we need to debate, rather than just uh, whether non-government schools should be funded. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here. I think we've covered it, but I'll ask it anyway, because the person took the time to ask it. Uh, let's stick, I'll give it to Kevin first up. To what extent do you agree that one of the most socially divisive and undermining and undermining of democracy decisions parents can make is to enrol their children in private schools? Well, I'd have to disagree. Uh, obviously, as I say, we don't live in sort of North Korea or, or, or Vietnam or, you know, Burma, Myanmar, where I was last year, where the state does control what happens. We are actually in a, uh, a mixed economy. Uh, there is government ownership, there is private ownership, whether it's transport, health, I think we're kind of used to the fact that you can have private uh, uh, utilities, you can have non-government schools, not that I'm saying they should be privatised, I don't believe I ever have, but we live in a country where we value that choice. And I'd argue as a parent, we had a very strong view that we didn't want our children to go to secular government schools. We wanted an Anglican school where there was a sense of, of faith James uh, did confirmation uh, at that school and communion. Every week uh, there would be school assemblies where they would read from the parables, they would read from the Bible. Uh, religious education instruction was compulsory. Just because parents want that choice, and I think up to 80-90% of independent schools are faith-based, if you add the Catholic systemic schools, then obviously the overwhelming non-government schools are faith-based. I don't believe parents should be uh, penalised because of that choice. And as I said before, there was some research in Australia by the uh, Australian Youth Foundation. Catholic school kids, actually, there's less racism in Catholic schools compared to government schools in this research. And uh, an LSAE, LSAE project, Australia, showed that Catholic and independent school kids are more willing to volunteer. So I'd argue, in fact, that, and a lot of this goes back to James Coleman in America, that non-government schools are very strong at building social capital and reciprocity and uh, openness. I don't believe they lead to, uh, you know, less democracy. Thank you. David? Thank you. Look, we can hardly refuse parents the right to enrol their children in any school they wish to, if that school meets their religious or other requirements. I've not said that I'm against school choice. That doesn't mean that the taxpayer, however, must fund whatever lifestyle choice that parent makes. The system of equal per capita grants to non-government schools is inequitable and unjust, and also very, very wasteful. The best-selling author, David Gillespie, shows parents how to choose the best school for their kids. Anybody read his book? And how to make a less than perfect system better. He concludes, Though he could afford to buy the best education possible, he writes, streaming our entire education system, creating a multi-tiered system that not only entrenches disadvantage at the bottom, but weakens the entire system. So the first step in addressing the stratification of Australian schooling is protecting and enhancing the dimensions of public education. Until we have a well-resourced public school in every community, there is actually no real choice for families. And so when a parent makes that decision to send their child to a private school, and I'll put up my hand, and my middle child, my daughter, decided that she wanted to go to a private school because she had special circumstances at that time, and I supported her decision to go that way. But I was prepared to pay for that. I did not feel it necessary for other people who earn a lot less than me to subsidise my lifestyle choice for my daughter. So that when parents make the decision, and it's one of the hardest decisions that they ever do make, they, and all parents want the very, very best for their child, where do I send my child to school? And someone earlier today said to me that if I had $5 for every time I get asked, where should I send my child? 
I could have retired years ago, and that's the same with me as well. Everyone, all my friends and their friends' families and their kids want me to tell them where to send their child to school. Each parent will make up their mind based on that choice. But if they do, don't send their child to the local public school, they are in the, inevitably, in the end, disadvantaging all other students and all other, other people in Australia and therefore are making an anti-democratic choice. In the United States, the home of capitalism, private schools do not receive any public funding. There is a, at least one principle that they uphold in the United States, and that is that, that there is a demarcation line between religion and society. And public, the public system does not fund religion. In Chile recently, they have defunded all private schools from the public purse uh, because they are all Catholic schools. And this is the way that we need to see our future. We need, there are two things I was discussing earlier on that we need to, if we want to change and reform Australia's education, the first thing we need to do is cut that nexus between Year 12 results and university entrance. And the second one is to wind back the clock back to a genuine public education system that meets the needs of all children back to the time when private schools were there for the minority and not for now 40% of our people. Okay, thank you. We're going to hand across the floor. I think there's supposed to be somebody with a microphone. Who's, here we go, Michelle's there. So uh, perhaps the front. Anne, I think it is. It seems to me that the states would support private education because in the long run, it will reduce the amount that they have to fund. In uh, my own state, we watched the um, plant of the public schools run down as the federal government um, built the beautiful uh, facilities of the new private schools. So uh, I was just wondering if you've got a comment about that. Was there a question? Sorry. Well, the question, uh, if I've uh, it, it is a, it's an opposite, you know, I just wonder about the states and their, um, you know, that they do actually support private education because... How much funding do private schools get from the states? I suppose we can... I mean, it's a complex that. issue. Uh, if you're talking about recurrent funding, state and federal, then I've already said what the figures are. So obviously the, the wealthy independent schools like King or Br Brisbane Grammar... They might only get one or two thousand, one and a half thousand, say, you can look it up on the My School website. They don't get nearly as much uh, as a systemic local parish school, say, in re rural, regional Australia. So it is needs-based, and I've got no problem with that. As I said before, if you're looking at infrastructure, apart from the BER, the Building the Education Revolution, and I think that, that was atypical, if you're looking at independent schools, and Catholic schools, 90% of the capital works comes from local funds. So forget the BER, 90% comes from local funds. So Commonwealth and state governments aren't building the, you know, maintaining the sporting grounds or building the swimming pools or, I mean, good luck to them. I'm a great believer in if a school and parents raise the money, they can spend it however they like. So I, I just question this idea that somehow non-government schools are awash with money. As I've said, based on Jennifer Buckingham's research, a lot of schools, government independent and Catholic, are in a similar uh, price range in terms of government funding. And I'll just finish by saying, some years ago you might, if you're old enough, will remember in the Goulburn area where they uh, threatened to close down the Catholic schools because there was a New South Wales government directive that the schools had to spend more on, on infrastructure. The Catholic schools, they didn't have the money because they weren't being funded. So the, the local communities and the uh, bishops said, we'll shut down our schools next month and all of our students will then enrol in the government schools nearby. It never happened because the Premier realised the government schools would be awash, they'd be overwhelmed and the government would go broke trying to pay for it all.
Thank you. Now, the next, the idea is to go alternating questions. So, do we have somebody who wants to ask David a question? Yeah, I want to ask David. Well, one, I congratulate David on <clears throat> on his paying of the full cost of funding your daughter in a private school. Um, I'm assuming that's what you're doing. Done a long time ago. Oh, but did you, offer, did you I mean, offer to pay the full recurrent you, cost yes, of the child's education? Yes, you, you paid the full, full recurrent cost. Well, that's fantastic. We should have more parents um, like you, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to call like David in my school. Um, <coughs> the other point I'd make is that um, if we want uh, there to be uh, issue around democracy and the funding of schools, then let's get our politicians to be highly transparent and our school teachers in our system and put their hand up to tell us where they actually send their children to school. Because you would find, of course, that there are significant people in the uh, political class who send their children to Catholic schools and independent schools and would not be willing to put up their hand in terms of voting for that that uh, system. The second thing I want to make a point uh, of is that the American system, the American system, yes, it says that uh, if you uh, are independent school, you do not get funding. But you, the other point that you're neglecting to highlight is they don't tell you what curriculum to use, nor do they uh, require you to be in the um, uh, assessment system for national testing and so on. So they, they Yes, they don't fund, but they also don't control. So I think it's... Uh, it's is there a question? Sorry. Yeah, the question, <laughs> I feel like I the question is, why, is, why, for example, has have we not seen a shift to a truly uh, a needs-based voucher system uh, which, you know, which then uh, examines uh, the ability of people to pay uh, and then provides people with the opportunity of choice? Sure. Look, um, to answer your, only your last question, we do have a needs-based voucher system. It's called taxation. No, that's not. We pay our taxation and we choose to either use the benefits that are provided out of that taxation for, for public benefit or not. We have public hospital system which is provided for all of us free of charge. You can walk into any public hospital with an illness and get the very, very best medical care. Okay, the food might not be so good and you won't have a private room, but you'll have the best specialists treating you. If you choose not to use the public hospital system and you want to go to a private hospital system, you will pay through the nose. You'll pay $500 to get a Band-Aid on your finger if you come into emergency. And, and that's the way it should be. We have a voucher system in this country, I'll repeat, we pay taxation. Those people who do not pay taxation get their services free of charge. That's why we live in a social democracy and a social welfare system. If you want to, if, if you go to the United States, people there cannot afford to pay for prescriptions in medicine. They cannot afford to go to see a doctor because they don't have universal free public health care like we do and like their Canadian cousins across the border do. And that's why Obama tried to bring in uh, a uh, genuine public health, universal public health cover system. They have a public school system and the private schools in the United States that are not funded by the public, though their children from those schools go on to the Ivy League uh, universities which are charging $100,000 per, per annum for their, for their students to go, to go there. They don't need to go through the public education system to be tested and, and inspected because they don't need it. Uh, in Australia we have, as, I, as Kevin Sorry, said, we've only got 10 minutes so yeah, we need to move a tripartite, We have a tripartite system. Uh, schools don't have to follow the national curriculum. In fact, we've got... No, we do, we, actually. We were, we were told in Queensland we had to or we wouldn't get funding. That's so, funding. Well, that's, that's right. That's you, funding. you won't get funding. But, you, but in Finland, for example, uh, where there are private schools, if they charge any money, they no longer get any public funding. Uh, that's the way it should be. All right, sorry.
Yes. Um, oh, hi. Uh, I've oh, got sorry. the, micro I've got the microphone, and if yep. you're Tony Jones, then I've got deja vu. Um, I, I, my question is, I guess, to Kevin. So, um, you talked about mobility, and I had my kids start school in Wilcannia and Clarenabri, and I'd just like to ask, what about the people that, that with, with no choice, because there's no access, and they have no finances to make any other choice? Um, so, you, you talk about choice, um, but if you can't access that choice, it's not a choice. Um, so you need to make sure that those kids are actually getting the resources that they need to get to lift their standards. I totally agree, and uh, we used to call it, call it when I was in the VSDA back in the days when I was a radical. We used to call it equality of opportunity. So regardless of where you live in Australia or your your parents' occupation or qualification, the belief was that, and should, uh, it should still be there that you have equality of opportunity. So I, I'm from Melbourne, whether you live in Broadmeadows where I grew up, which is Housing Commission, whether you live in, in uh, the eastern suburbs, in Surrey Hills, Canterbury, Hawthorne, if you go to a local primary or a local secondary school, the kids should not be disadvantaged because they're going to a government school. So the quality of the teaching, the, the rigour of the curriculum, the, the, the facilities available should all be up to the required level. And as I said, I quoted the OECD, it says our underperforming schools are the best resourced, the best resourced around the world. Now, I don't see the issue there. Uh, obviously, all schools, all students need a level of funding. And again, the research shows this. Once that level of funding is reached, more money by itself won't improve anything. It gets back to the other matters I've, I've raised. And frankly, I don't want to say this, but I will. Some people won't make it. I mean, I grew up in Broadmeadows, as I keep saying. A, a lot of the kids left at year 9 and 10, did an apprenticeship. They didn't go to university like I did. Do I think any less of them? No. I mean, they're making more money. The sparkies and plumbers and tradies than I ever did or will. So I'm a great believer in equality of opportunity. What I don't accept is equality of outcomes. Right, with well, those questions, you'd go to David. Somebody got a question for David? No, gee, Kevin, you're popular. All right, sorry, wait, over here to behind you, Mission. Uh, thank you, just like to take a little step sideways, if I may. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're all probably going to agree to disagree on funding. What, in your opinion, is the more important argument or topic that needs to be addressed in education outside of funding? Who's that to? Rick, Dave. Um, okay, look there. I'd like to quote Professor Alan Reid, who's written a wonderful, wonderful um, report. Oh, my favourite. Uh, from, he's from the University of South Australia. Uh, and he wrote it for the Principals um, Association of Australia. And he talks about the fundamental, <coughs> fundamental dimensions for public education. He talks about three things at least. And he says that these three fundamental dimensions must work together. To neglect one of them is to weaken the others. He talks about public education as a public good. This dimension emphasises public schools as a free public resource to which everyone has the rights of access and which cannot exclude anyone. Secondly, he says, public education for the common good. This dimension involves public schools nurturing the skills, dispositions, understandings of children and young people, not only to develop them as individuals, but also to benefit the wider society. And thirdly, a well-resourced public school in every community. This dimension assumes that the properly resourced public schools are the sine qua non of a democratic society if education is to be available to all on equal terms. Currently, unfortunately, Australia has an approach to education funding which tolerates and promotes huge disparities in education resources. And I disagree with Kevin about the resourcing. And I disagree with John Hattie about that as well. Uh, if we go up to Arakoon, which 
their academy school, which just has closed down until the rest end of the term. They may have had some very good resources because Noel Pearson was able to squeeze out millions and millions of dollars out of one government after another. But their teaching through direct instruction destroyed that school. Yes, By picking up one of those neo-liberal fads from the United States destroyed the education system of that school. And if they had listened to an educator like Chris Sara up there, who knows Indigenous education, got two PhDs in it, then Noel Pearson, who's a lawyer, might have learned something. So these are the crucial issues about what does public education mean? Public education is a public good for the common good and a well-resourced public school in every community. All right, thank you. We've probably got time for two more questions and not much more, I think, because uh, Kevin has to go to the airport and you want to go to drinks. <laughs> thank you. This is for Kevin. Um, just one sort of comment and then maybe a statement you might like to sort of give me your opinion on. I take issue with the seeking the moral high ground when you talk about the right to sort of faith-based education and this, that and the other. Now, if faith-based education is so successful, then your schools are full, but according to an article in this weekend's Australian, then the churches are empty, so I'm not quite sure that one's quite working out for that <laughs> aspect of it. The other one, Tony Crean recently in Tasmania was published in the Examiner. Now, Tony Crean is the head of the Independent Schools Principals Association or Association of Tasmania, and he was published as saying, actually, um, in our private sector schooling that's obviously quite well resourced, they're actually rejecting kids with a disability and saying, actually, please go to the public school because we really can't afford and don't want to pay for you to be in our school. Was that happening? In Tasmania. And that was published in the, a newspaper called The Examiner in plain open print. And the suggestion that they were actually accepting sort of voluntary donations from parents to actually allow their child to stay in that sort of private school. So as far as a sort of moral and ethical private sector system, I'm thinking, hmm, okay. Now, if we then we go to the funding one, now, as we know, the sort of state schools are funded primarily out of the state and territory budget, so roughly 86% of their funding comes from that budget. Private sector schooling, 75% of their funding comes straight from the Commonwealth Government. So if you're looking for a fair go, why don't we see Gonski's original recommendation to rebalance the funding provision so that you share an equal proportion of your funding from the state budget, which can obviously come via the sort of grant from the federal government, and then it can be decided by the grassroots politicians in the states and territories in which the schools are based, and surely that would give a fair and equitable argument for local need according to what's expected by the voters in that state and territory. Well, we might need a short answer to a long question. Yeah, very short. I mean, I think I, I quoted the figures. Government schools, 94% funding comes from state and commonwealth. Catholic schools only get 72%. Independent schools less, 42%. So parents are making up the difference. Uh, I'm a great believer in vouchers, actually, and I don't believe the taxation system uh, equates with, with a proper voucher system, as I have in places like Milwaukee and I think uh, Washington State. Uh, there's a lot of good research going around about the uh, impact of that, especially on uh, what, what I, if I'm allowed to say, uh, black Americans living in, 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 in poverty, frankly, in, in urban ghettos, where they're so popular, these charter schools, that they actually have to have a ballot to see who can go to them. So I'm a great believer in vouchers, uh, greater flexibility in choice. Uh, I mean, I think it's about 70%, 68% of Australians still identify in the census as, as religious, as, as Catholic or uh, Christian or Anglican or Methodist or Protestant. And as uh, the research shows, when you look at the increase in enrolments and growth in schools, the biggest enrolments have been in Islamic schools and low fee paying denominational Christian schools. So they've got a market and the market's increasing. Now, what that's got to do with parents going to mass or to the synagogue or to the, uh, to the, uh, you know, the prayers, I'm not quite sure. But the reality is it's happening. And I'd suggest, as the international covenants do, that parents should not be unfairly discriminated against because of that choice, especially to be really provocative when in Victoria the state government's going to mandate the LGBTQI Safe Schools Program, where a lot of religious parents will be aghast 
and will probably think, I don't want my kid to go to a government school if that's how they're going to teach gender and sexuality. OK, um, one more question, and ideally for David. Yeah, we've got two hands up. I may be one of the few people in the room who can lay claim to having worked for 10 years in government schools, then nearly 20 years in Catholic schools, and last year I ran off to the warm and welcoming arms of the Lutherans in the Barossa Valley. Um, by this time of day, I've always had a glass of wine, so I will, um, I will keep it short. Um, I think the great shame is that the public versus private debate always ends up being uh, a debate about dollars. And just in the last few minutes, I've been watching it as comments are made on Twitter, uh, there's been a hashtag, learning not dollars. And I think that perhaps what we should be talking about is more so um, isolated rural schools, indigenous schools, uh, Islamic schools, and how we might create opportunities there. I wonder, David, if, if you would just concede, and hopefully you will, that um, no amount of dollars will transform a school and make it a good school. That what is important is the quality of the teaching that goes into the school, um, and you've both alluded to that at one stage or another, and, you know, that perhaps to, to talk about funding, we should be more interested in resourcing schools in human ways rather than in dollar terms. Sure, it's a great question. Thanks, Simon. Uh, in simple terms, human capital is the most expensive input into all schools. About 80% of the recurrent budget of every school pays teachers and staff and non-teaching staff as well. And if we look, as I have done, at the, um, at the My School data very, very closely, we can see that not only do private schools uh, across the board have a lower staff-student ratio, but they have a much larger non-teaching staff to student ratio by a factor of 50% to public schools. They have a lot more ancillary staff that take the load off the teachers so that the teachers can focus on what they're paid to do and that's teach children and on quality teaching. And all of us are hopefully going to be able to watch um, uh, Revolution School again tonight. I think it's on again tonight, part two. That school paid many thousands of dollars to bring in consultants like John Hattie and others to turn that school around. It takes resources to do that. And so the short answer is, yeah, resources are not everything, but the human capital costs and costs dearly. Our total budget in education, in school education, is $34 billion per annum in this country. $10 billion of that goes to private schools from our public taxpayers' funding. Almost one third. We have to ask ourselves the question, if this is a choice, parents make for their children, shouldn't they pay for that choice fully? Okay, look, uh, we're drawing the uh, debate to a close. Uh, before we do, I just want to make a couple of comments. First of all, my school, if Gonski funding went through, we'd get more money. We were disappointed it didn't go through. Secondly, I've got about 20% of my kids on learning support at the school. Thirdly, our class sizes are actually quite large. We've got three staff at the back and they would have been... They would have been shaking their head when they heard we're supposed to have small class sizes. In fact, we don't. So I, my point is, I think, to be honest with you, the one of the issues we need to take control of is this discussion and learn more about each other and respect for each other. And too much of this debate has been driven by politicians who tell us what's going on in our schools, whereas, in fact, we should be talking to each other so we can learn more about what's going on in each other's schools and support <coughs> each other. 
because we're all involved in educating Australian kids. So I want to thank our two guest speakers for this evening. So thank you very much, gentlemen.